What did you grow up listening to? When I was really young, five to eight, nine, that's the kind of music I, I listened to. Because in in my house, that was that was pop radio. I mean, what I call jazz. I mean, you're calling that jazz standards. What I call jazz is endless improvising on those songs, where you hear the melody maybe for 30 seconds, and after that, they're off in outer space playing. Oh, that's jazz to me. When I play standards, I stick to the melody. I just, I just love the melody of those songs. Something, unfortunately, you don't hear much today. You don't hear, you hear four note melodies with a riff underneath, endless looping riff, right? And it's, so I go back and say, oh, whatever happened to April in Paris or, or uh, you know, or yes, well, even yesterday. I, I, can, I consider that a standard. And that's not jazz. Yeah, that's true. Right? Uh, While My Guitar Gently Weeps. I mean, the Beatles stuff had melodies. So anything that had a melody, that, that's what I play. And yeah, I can improvise on it, but I generally don't when I'm alone. I just go to one song to another to another because it's relaxing. And, and it keeps my fingers keeps me thinking. Those songs have a lot more chord structure, so I'm always thinking diminished, augmented, minor seventh, you know, instead of n not that three chord songs are bad. I'm not saying that. I like all kinds of music. Does that make things clear as mud? It does, <laughs> but you it was Philadelphia, is it not? Yeah, it's Philadelphia. I want to put some perspective. Well, Chester that. actually. Chester, which is a Pennsylvania. Suburb, a suburb. So this was in the 40s, and it was largely pop music. So what happened between the 40s and the 50s that changed, the, the cultural musical cross-currents that changed well, your listening? back then, uh, there was separate radio programs. And um, there were black programs, hillbilly programs, pop programs, and never the twain should meet. And they all had their own audience. And no one ever thought of mixing. Then they would, oh, you'd never mix it. There's big band, and there was, you know, there was uh, white gospel, black gospel. Uh, but in Chester, it was interesting because you had a lot of immigrants, and you had, you had the blacks, you had the Italians, the Polish, Lithuanians, living in a fairly small town, right? And where I lived, I could go, I could go two blocks south and hear country music, and hear all this stuff. I can go two blocks north and hear black blues. And I grew up, I'm a Ukrainian in descent, so I grew up with polkas. So I had <laughs> all these kinds of music that I, heard, that I heard and grew up to, but they never, they never meshed. So I just went and listened. Oh, I like polkas, I like country, or they call, didn't call it country, hillbilly. Hillbilly music. In fact, my parents took took this to, to a place called Sunset Park on Sundays, and it was hillbilly bands, you know? And I used to sit there, and I was mem mesmerized by music, although they never wanted to play an instrument. My dad played violin by ear and accordion by ear, and he used to play and play piano by ear and sit around and play. I was inter interested. I used to sit on a swing. I remember swinging as high as I can and singing songs. I loved music, never had the desire to play. How'd you get involved in playing guitar? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start jumping ahead a little bit, okay? I'm going to talk about Bill Haley a little bit. Sure. At the same time, when I'm, say, around 12 or 13, uh, Bill Haley and his group, the Saddlemen, he, he had a man in the group, Billy Williamson, who was a steel guitar player. He was a guy that, he was a guy that really is the undiscovered man that brought black music and country music together. And he would say that he would say to Bill Haley, you know, I know this because he was my roommate for three years. Uh, and he would talk to me, and he'd never talk to anybody else about it. And he'd say, you know, uh, black blues and country music isn't that far apart. If you think about it, it's not really. We use the same three chord structures. We use, you know, the instrumentation is a little different. But why don't we try to take a black song and 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 could black musicians and white musicians together. Now, 1952, still a lot of prejudice around, you know? Team you 52. You had mixed groups, huh? Team 52? 1952. Oh, 1952, yes. Yeah. There was, you would never have black musicians and white musicians play together local, just locally. But in, there was a little record company in, in Chester, Essex Records. So what they did is, on their own, 
they did songs like Crazy Man Crazy, What You Gonna Do, uh, Rock the Joint, and they used black musicians and white musicians together. So they did black, fundamentally black blues songs, up the tempo to country beats, right? And put it out, and it was totally new sound. People didn't know what to call it. Crazy Man Crazy and Rock the Joint were released and were regional hits. I mean, the kids loved it. There was no, no name rock and roll. They just said this new kind of country swing. You know, they didn't know what to call it. Meantime, I was listening to this music, not on the records, yet. One day, uh, I, got, I, I, I got very sick. I, I got, it wasn't pneumonia, I got the, I forget. What did I get? Bronchitis. Bronchitis, thank you. And the doctors had house calls back then. And, and I was out of school, laying on the couch, and he said, you can go to school tomorrow, which I hated. Oh, God, I gotta go back to school. But he said, before I leave, you want the radio on? And we had a little Emerson, I'll never forget it, a little Emerson, white radio and he put in on and what comes on the station but crazy man crazy and i listened to it and i said immediately i recognized it's something new something i really like so i told my told my parents i want to play the guitar and they said no you don't because they tried to get me to play mandolin through the church i skipped every lesson i hated it they tried to get me to play violin i had i didn't even like the sound of a violin didn't like it so they took me to a music shop in Chester called Caruso's Music. The teacher was Pop Caruso. He was about 80 then, very, very Italian. Do your, can you do your Italian accent? Italian pizza pasta made the perfect. You talk about the scarabs, do it. With the mandolin, the 16th. Pizza pasta made the perfect. What's the matter for you? What's the matter for me? Hey, what? That's him. They've been in the country 20 years. Sound I just got off board yesterday. Imagine taking lessons from somebody like that. That's the way he talked. And he said to me, and, and you can repeat it if you want. It says, your hands are too small. Yeah, hands too small. I can take the mandolin. The hands too small. <laughs> hey, man. He says, and and he, my mother secretly told him, discouraging, because he's not really interested. So he gave me the worst guitar and rented the worst guitar in the shop called a cowboy guitar. And never forgot, the strings were about that far off, off the neck. So I went home and I practiced so much that my fingers actually bruised. And after about three weeks, he told my parents, he, in his nice way, this boy really wants to play. You better get him a better guitar. So then I became, it became a passion. I mean, so much so that I would go upstairs and play, and your mother, my mom would say, you've been up there for two hours playing. And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not, I don't even be here half an hour. And I'd look at the watch. Oh, God, it's been two hours. Make a long story boring. Two years later, I was 14, 16, I had my own group. And we played at high school gyms. And rock and roll, this now, well, now we're talking around 56. Rock and roll was already big. You know, rock around the clock was already a big hit. Bill Haley was a big hit. Elvis was starting to come out. And uh, so we were playing. And <clears throat> a son of a, a local club owner was in the audience at Chichester Junior High School where we played. And he said, I want to tell my father about, about you. And I thought, oh, yeah. So I got a call and I went down to a bar. It was in Trainer PA. The bar's no longer there. Called Rocco's. His name was Carlo D'Antonio. And he said, how would you guys like to play here six nights a week, 9 p.m. to 2 p.m., Monday through Saturday? And then bands got paid. He said, I'll pay, I'll pay each guy $80 a week. 80, 80 bucks a week. In 56, that's pretty good money. He said, but I don't, we, we called ourselves, we called ourselves, I think the first band, band we, we called ourselves the Tremonts. They said, no. Nah. He said, we got to get people in the place. We're going to call you the Sensational Youngsters. <laughs> now, there were very few teenage bands because everybody in the band except the bass player, my best friend, John Thomas Shevsky, who we nicknamed Polly, he was 20. And I said, okay. And we packed the place for a year. I mean, we stayed there for a solid year. So for six nights I'm playing, going to school. 
I get home at three in the morning, up at six, go to wow. school. And I did this, but I was financially independent because I was making eight dollars a week. Back then, there was a lot of oh, money. Oh yeah, in in '67, I had my own car. I bought my own car. Um, in '68, I'm sorry, '67, I bought a '67 Ford Fairlane hardtop convertible. It's only one year old. Fifty-seven, car. right? Huh? Fifty-seven. It's six, at fif, in '58, I bought the car. But okay, there was you were a saying '57 car. You were saying '60. I'm sorry, five, yeah, yeah, five, okay. five. So, and then I, then the band played, and I, and we did a 50 mile radius around, around Philadelphia, and got really well known. Played all the local bars, and um, then I, and then uh, I graduated high school and went to work at Scott Paper Company, makes toilet paper, and I worked in the actual factory. And when the machines broke down, I used to write words to music on toilet paper. So you got a little behind in your work. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> and, and, uh, oh, sorry, that was too easy. Uh, the, uh, but it was shift work, so I couldn't play music, and I wasn't very happy. So I, I went to college, and make a long story short, I took chemistry because... My mother said, "You got to learn a trade. You got to learn to do something." But then I, but the, since college was daytime, the band got back together. During the time we were we were touring, Bill Haley's manager came into one of the gigs we played in Westchester, and came to me and said, uh, "Franny Beecher and and Rudy Pompelli are leaving Bill's band." He says, "I want them to hear you because I think you'll fit in the band." And I said, "Okay, all right." We can backtrack a little bit. Franny Beecher. Is, is was the guitar the, the guitar player he was the one in rock around the clock that was the original solo that was no 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 the original solo was done by a, a guy named Danny Cedrone he had his own his own little band and he only played on record sessions when bill played in person there was no there was only a steel guitar there was no spanish guitar all the solos was done by billy williamson on pedal steel? Well, not pedal steel. We just had a, he had a flat steel. We didn't use pedal steel. So, but he played the solos because then there was no rock and roll. When when they recorded, uh, the guy running the session says we need regular guitar in here. So they hired Danny to do the sessions. Danny Cedrone was on all of the recordings, but never played live because he had his own little group. So, um, interesting thing about that is right. Two weeks after Rock Around the Clock was released, Danny died. He never heard the song being a hit, never realized that he had the first memorable guitar solo ever, you know, ever recorded. Memorable, that everybody tried to copy, uh, which was a kind of a pet solo, he, he, one he liked to do. They did that solo earlier on... Um, Rock the Joint, the same exact solo. You're kidding, really? Same exact solo. That. The reason it was done on Rock Around the Clock is because during the session for DECA, uh, Bill Haley got hired by DECA. There was a song called 13 Women, which they thought was going to be the smash. It was a four-hour session. Uh, at that time, there was a ferry that took you across the Delaware River. It hit a sandbar. So everything that would go wrong could go wrong. They were a half hour late for the session. So they spent they spent three hours on 13 women. They had a half hour left. So they had three and a half hours left of a four hour session. So, so, so uh, Milt Gabler, who ran the session, said, what do you want to do for a B-side? Bill said, we got this great song, Rock Around the Clock, which they rehearsed in, his, in, in Bill's house the night before, but just barely, you know. Uh, and uh, they said, okay, okay, let's do, let's do it. Let's do it, get it over with. Let's record the song. So he said, well, we're we, here, we put, the, put, the, put the same guitar solo you did, Danny, and rock the joint. Do the same one. And I and Billy Williamson said, but, Danny said, why? He said, because I like it. Play it. And the song was in A. For those of you that know music, A is a difficult hall for saxophone. It's a difficult, difficult key. They'd rather play in B flat. Because yes. right, A is yeah. you know seven sharps. So, so yes. he said, now we want a sax solo. He couldn't play a sax solo, so he said, okay, let's do an old time uh, big band riff. 
ba 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 da da. One, two notes. Just play one note, and when it goes to the five chord, you change the note. You go up a whole tone. So he said, you play the note. So that's how the second part, ba ba, became the song. So they're playing shots. Yeah. Da 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 da. So that was in. They said, okay, record the band first, and they had brand new equipment. They had hard, hardly ever used hi-fi equipment. They over-modulated the guitar. The guitar is a little loud. And so the recording engineer, and I wasn't there, but this is what I was told, said, the guitar is recorded, is, is over-modulated, means a little distorted, a little bit. The, the man running the session said, never mind, it's a B-side. Now let's get Bill to do the overdub voice. So they overdubbed Bill's voice and rock around the clock and they said, that's it, you're done. And they left very disheartened because they said, you know, Bill really thought rock around the clock was the song to be the hit. And Decker said, nah, they just put it out there. Well, guess what? That was it. All the mistakes, the, the, the guitar being overmodulated, the the, the 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 solo from another song, the sax solo that was never happened. They just played the, the riff that everybody remembers. Bah, bah. All came together magically and made the song that changed the world. It introduced rock and roll to the world. Now, people tell me rock didn't start in Philly. It started in Memphis. It started in Chicago. Yeah, it was being played a little bit everywhere. But Philly is where it came so together. So why did Philly get overlooked? Excuse me? Why did it get overlooked? You know, it's hard to say. They were going to put the Rock and Roll Museum in Philadelphia. It was, it was the number one contender. But because we already had the Liberty Bell and Constitution, there's so many attractions, we need to put it somewhere else. And they said, ah, Alan Freed. Alan Freed was the first so-called uh, rock and roll this jockey, and that was done in what? Where, where, where did we go? That was in uh, Mistake on the Lake. Um, Mistake the, on the Lake. Mistake on the Lake. That's what they call it. The town. Uh, I can't think of it. I can't think of the town. Right around my head. Well, wherever the Rock and Roll Museum is Cleveland. right now. Cleveland. 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 Thank you. Cleveland. They put it in Cleveland because nothing Mistake was there. Mistake on the Lake is Cleveland. <laughs> because there was nothing there but industry. So they said... Oh, Alan Freed broadcast from Cleveland, so we'll put it in Cleveland. That will draw really? people. That's Alan Freed broadcast. I always thought it was this from New York. Well, he later, when he became popular, but he started in Cleveland. He started, and then he became a big DJ. And he moved to New York. Mm -hmm. Then he went to the movies, and he became a star. And started payola, all that kind of stuff. The payola scandals. Oh yeah, and he got took the took the wind out of the sails. Oh yeah, because. He, you know, he got to say, well, all these rock and roll young kids want hit records, they're going to pay me to get them. I'll play them if they pay me, you know? So, I mean, it, it was, it's business, you know? So that's... What was the payola scandals exactly? What year was that? Oh, that had, had to be... That was the late 50s, early 60s. Every, but the, once there was a hearing and he got, he got really fined and... I mean, he became a criminal. It was kind of done under, you know, under undercover. It was still done, but not so openly. You know, it was inference. You know, like, oh, we'll play your song, but you know, uh, you know, and, uh, they never said like, pay me something. But you, artists, kind of knew you had to kick some of the money back, but it was never said openly. So Elvis probably still going on. Elvis toured the United States in a fleet of Cadillacs. How exactly did Bill Haley and the Commons get around? Excuse me. Elvis toured the United States in a fleet of Cadillacs. How exactly did Bill Haley and the Commons travel? At first, they had a bus. They we had we had they called band boys, which are roadies today. But back then, they called them band boys, and they had a bus, and they went around on a bus, and they had people set up the equipment, but didn't carry their own sound system. That didn't happen in the 50s. You were at the mercy of whatever sound system was in the, in the venue. I mean, no one thought of that. So if you had a 35 watt amplifier amplifying to 300 people, that's what you had. Generally, you had one microphone and you just turn your guitars amps up as loud as you could, which distorted a lot. So the later musician said, hey, that's the way it's supposed to sound. 
And he goes, because we wanted to get a clean sound, but you turned them up so loud they were distorted. And there were no pedals back then, correct? No sound. No, no, no pedals. pedals. No, what you see is what, what you hear is what you get. You had little, you know, the little tweed Fender tweed amps or, you know, and a bass amp, Fender made an amp, but they were like, if you got a 50 watt amp, you had a big, powerful amp, you know, and you're, you're playing for two or 300 people, you, you put them up on tables or whatever just so that they can hear it. And you sang through one mic, and if there's two people singing, which the Beatles did early, they sang, you sang next to each other, right? Because they didn't put two or three. Once in a while, you'd get a second mic, but there was no sound then. The, the, the British group really started that. Somebody there said, why don't we carry our own PA systems to control our sound? But most, when I first went with Bill in 1960, no, we didn't carry any sound equipment. Not until about... 64, we started carrying sound equipment, our own PA. So speaking of the early 60s, I wonder if we could reiterate the story of when Bill Haley was in Germany and the Cuban Missile Crisis was going on. Just oh, that's... Okay, okay. We were in Germany, and we happened to be there playing, which which Bill really did. We played for all, all of the U.S. bases in Germany, you know, mostly Germany, France... And we played for, and we happened to be in Fulda, Fulda, Germany, which is right on the Czechoslovakian border during the missile crisis. Now, literally 500 yards on the other side of where we're playing were 300 Russian tanks. The commander of the post took us up to the high part and he said, This is, as a, what if there's World War III? He says, Our mission is to hold for five minutes. <laughs> He says, that's, that's what our mission is. We have 100 tanks, they have 300. He says, we're, we're supposed to hold the Russians back for five minutes. And if we get declaration of war, if we know there's a war, we have dog tags made for you. You're going to be you in the army because we don't want you to be shot as spies. So he says, so we're gonna, you'll be in the army. So when we were playing the show in an afternoon show, I'll never forget this, there were people in the audience the military with steel helmets, rifles, and it was we we're playing, you know, rock around the clock, rock the joint, <laughs> all the stuff, and there's nothing because they think the, it's going, the world's going to end, right? All of a sudden, through the loudspeaker in the middle of the show, voice came over from the base saying, "The Russian ships have turned back from Cuba. They're they turned back. Oh, they threw their helmets up in the air." And, and then it changed. They start dancing on the stage, and that I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that because we thought like this is it, and it just changed overnight. So we knew we knew there was not going to be a war. So Kennedy bluffed Khrushchev, and he won because I don't really didn't know. We, we didn't think Khrushchev was going to turn. turn so that around. was October '62. October. So, so speaking, speaking of changes, the Beatle invasion and the English invasion and all that was still a couple of years away. Well, in 62, we were working uh, in Germany, there were in, in, in Hamburg, there was a place called the Star Club. Say it in German, Star Club. The Star Club. That's, that's it. Yeah, that's is good in the Star Club. The Star Club. That's, that's not for the Beatles dying. That's is good and play another one. That's the way they announced Yeah. How would you announce Bill Haley in the Comets with that accent? Well, there's a rock post in Deutschland, the Bill Haley and Comets, put your hands together. Exactly. Yeah, that's good. Exactly. That's a good song, play another song, yeah. It sounds like last one. <laughs> you no, know, I want you to play something, one, six, four, five, progression. Get away from three chords. No, wait a minute. No, listen, I'm tired of hearing three chords. <laughs> you put a six in there, there's no six. Yeah, that's just the One, four, five. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, anyway, at the Star Club, there were there, there were the groups like Jerry and the Pacemakers, the Searchers were playing there. You guys and, played in the same building? Oh yeah, we played. On, yeah, we became good friends. They they actually liked me. I don't know why. And they had a tradition. Any other visiting groups? Um,